Hi, listeners. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Today's episode, I'm interviewing a former D.C. employment attorney turned leader and voice for women, diversity, inclusion, and work flexibility. You will learn how professional service firms and companies are taking an honest look at their culture and making changes. And just a reminder, the transcript of this audio is available in a PDF download. Go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. As many of you know, We interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, general counsels, and legal consultants. You are listening to episode 18 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Enjoy a front row seat with law firm leaders, their partners, and legal consultants as we discuss life and leadership. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Manar Morales, the president and CEO of the Diversity and Flexibility Alliance. Manar began her career as an employment litigator representing clients in all aspects of labor relations and employment law. She has litigated in federal court before federal administrative agencies and in arbitration. In addition, Manar served as an adjunct faculty member of Georgetown University, where she taught classes in labor and employment law and entrepreneurship. Menard serves on numerous boards and commissions. She is a Washington Advisory Council member for Common Sense Media, a member of the President's Council of Cornell Women, and a liaison to the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession. Welcome, Menard, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Chris, so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you today. Wonderful. Well, it's no surprise to my listeners to host you and to have you on this. I think, I believe you're probably on the front lines of some of the most important initiatives I would say professional service firms are facing right now, diversity, inclusiveness, flex work. So I want to just jump in and ask you, what are you finding for innovative ways where diversity and inclusive is being implemented either at companies, accounting firms, law firms? Can you speak to that? Sure. I, really where we're seeing the most success in large organizations and even on the on the smaller side as well is where they take a holistic approach to diversity and inclusion as, and flexibility. And we very much believe in looking at both organizational solutions and individual strategies. So where we see innovation happening is where we see organizations willing to take a close look at what's happening within their culture where they're looking beyond the metrics. It's important to look at your numbers, but your numbers will tell a story, but they only tell part of the story. And so being really able to peel back the layers and say, what is happening within our culture? What kind of culture do we have? What kind of culture do we intend to have? But what is really happening? And spend some time talking and listening to individuals within their organization to the way in which they experience their organization. And then from there, where you're really laying the groundwork, where we see the most change happening is where we can see leaders from the top, leadership from the top on these issues, so that the leaders are involved and wanting to push these initiatives forward. But beyond just calling them an initiative, really where they see that there is, it is a business imperative, and it is part of the success of their organization, and it's not just actually seen as a one-off initiative. And then from there is where they build in some accountability because it's really hard to create innovative changes within your organization and then not hold people accountable for those kinds of changes. And so we see success when leaders are doing that. That's phenomenal. Let me, let me ask you the question, though. How do you get a read on the culture? How do you pull back the layers and get the true story of what's going on? That's by having conversations. So first, having conversations with individuals. If you're dealing, if we're dealing with a, a law firm, with the attorneys, with the associates, finding really how do they experience the culture on a day-to-day basis, whether that's through focus groups or it's through insight interviews or it's through surveys or, frankly, the best way is through a combination of all of those mm-hmm. three uh, formats and really being able to get a sense of how do they feel when they come into their office every day, whether they feel included, what are the ways in which the firm is signaling that to them, and how do they actually experience the firm? 
But then I think another layer of that is so oftentimes we see that happen a lot where people are talking to associates or at least ones who have engaged us to to do that work. We're certainly leading with that. But also where you're actually talking to the partners, if you're in a law firm or even with accounting firms or professional services firms that you actually are talking to the leaders as well and getting a read from them on how they perceive the culture and how they perceive success within their own groups. Do you find when leadership engage you, basically, do you find like associates, staffs, partners that they're either reluctant or very interested and compliant and wanting to share things with you? It depends on the tone of the, I I think when it is clear that it's confidential, people want to have a conversation and they want, they, it depends on, I will say the culture. So when we go into an organization before we will survey or have any focus groups, I always ask what are you going to do with the information? Because if you're not willing to change, then surveying for the sake of surveying is really pointless. Mm. And so unless you're willing to do something with the information, don't ask. And so if we're going into an organization in which it's been clear, the groundwork has been laid that leaders are listening and they actually will be using that information to create real change, people are very willing and open to have those kinds of conversations. Where I see more hesitation around it is where the feeling of no matter what I say, nothing is going to change. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And have you sat down with, again, somebody and there's a a sense of relief to be able to share their story with you? Is there any specific stories or you can speak in generalities even about their story? But I mean, I imagine you coming in would be that for somebody. Absolutely. I mean, people want to feel like, uh, you know, I was working with an accounting firm and we were doing the insight interviews. And at the end of the interview, the person said to me that just felt like therapy. Right? There was an opportunity to actually share her experience and what she was feeling and being able to just articulate it out loud was able to just a sense of relief in in some ways that somebody was going to act that first of all, she wasn't alone, that other people were experiencing similar yeah. experiences, but an opportunity to see that change could happen as a yeah. result of that. Is that one of the main reasons why you are a part of and started Diversity and Flexibility Alliance? I mean, I certainly had my own path around uh, being an attorney and an employment litigator and having my first child and wondering what the path was going to be for me. I now have three boys and can understand the experience of wanting to continue and stay working and yet be able to see what the real challenges were and what everybody's experiencing and kind of matching that with the level of success that I wanted to achieve. Yeah, that's excellent. So aside from like kind of taking a read on the culture, once you get that read and you present it to managing partners or the leadership of the organization working with the company, I mean, what kind of responses are you getting from them? So I'm very clear when we are presenting our results that everybody needs to be listening to understand and not necessarily respond in that moment, because what you don't want to happen is people feeling defensive. And so Making it, again, it goes back to laying that groundwork, but the reason that you want to be talking to the individuals, because it's not your experience, it's their experience, and their experience is real. And whether you think it's a perception issue or a reality issue, their perception as leader, the perceptions of the individuals for you as a leader is your reality. And so we make it really clear that we have to actually take a step back to really listen so that we can look at the ways in which we can better understand the situation that you have. And yeah. for better or for worse, that is your culture defined by the people who are experiencing it. Yeah. Have you sat down with, again, leadership? And I mean, has there been responses of shock or or confirmation? I mean, it's, I imagine it's all the above. It, I, it is all of the above. And I think the important thing there is for leaders to understand that may not be your intent for your culture, but that is the impact of your or the intent of your behavior, but that is the impact of your behavior. And so what are the ways in which we can address it? And the reason why we do insight interviews and focus groups is because understanding it in the language of their culture is really important. I can talk all about the research and what it shows. And for example, that women are over mentored or under sponsored, but until they actually hear real examples, concrete examples within the culture of their own firm, it's 
very easy to say, oh, well, that, that may be true, but that's not happening here. But then when you can say, well, here are real examples of how people had it, or even as you talk about unconscious bias, and you can say, here are real examples of where pe- people are experiencing bias, it resonates more. And so you deliver the results, the leaders, you know, are listening to understand, and then what? Like, what, what happens after that? I mean, I imagine leaders will either agree with initiatives that you want to implement or just walk away? I mean, have you had some that are just not willing to kind of follow through? We haven't where they're not willing to follow through. We have, But again, that is because we spend a lot of time laying the groundwork for what this needs to look like in order to be successful. So we avoid the sort of one-offs. We're very much engaged to say, we'll do the conversations, but there's a commitment that we're also helping you create a strategic plan in response to the the insight interviews. or So there's always a sense of what comes next. Okay. And we're laying the groundwork for, okay, now we need to be, how are we going to be responsive to what you heard? And how do you design both organizational solutions and individual strategies that help you be responsive? Do you have the liberty to share some of those strategies that you recommend for some organizations? So for some of it is around whether it's a sponsorship initiative, whether it's an overhaul of your flexibility initiatives, looking at holistic flexibility, whether it's unconscious bias training. So there are things, whether it's creating metrics and dashboards in order to better track what's actually happening and how do you create a, for example, a women's initiative that's going to be powerful and responsive and strategic We're looking at all different areas. How does it impact the organization? How does it impact individuals? How do you monitor for progress? So we're putting into place a number of initiatives that will help or policy changes that not only are policy changes, but that are implemented in a way that get the kind of business results that you want to see and shift the culture. Yeah, you mentioned two things, and I I want to address the first one that I want to hit on, which, and all of those sound really powerful, but metrics and dashboards. I mean, can you elaborate? I mean, is that something that where you guys provide that tool and there's like survey, like ongoing survey feedback that is funneled into KPIs? I mean, what what is that? So in terms of the metrics is analyzing, there's a leadership path that exists at all organizations, and it's getting to better understand what that leadership path looks like and where do people fall within that path. And so some of it is a more um, an understanding of what where people are hitting their numbers okay. and what are you what are the key numbers that you're actually looking at and where people are falling. So that it's not a surprise. I mean if you look at law firms, right, they have new partner classes and if you see that the gender breakdown is skewed in new partner classes you can see that coming if you were analyzing along the way that um, path. So getting better a sense of that. Then looking at who's leaving, where are they going, who's coming in, what are the kinds of assignments. So really starting to analyze, at least from a numbers perspective, an understanding of where you're at within your organization. Okay. Yeah. And I can see how that would be really powerful. So the other one I wanted to just jump on that you brought up is, can you elaborate on flexibility, what that means. I know you brought that up initially with kind of your own story. What models are being looked at? Are any of them being successful as you're talking to firms, accounting, company? Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So we very much look at holistic flexibility as being important. So it's not a one size fits all, but that it is customized to individuals to meet both their personal and professional needs. Uh, and that we also look at it's not just about reduced hours, but it's also about forms. Reduced hours is important, uh, and it should be a key component. But we also look at what are the options for full-time flexibility. In other words, where people who are still working full-time but want to telecommute a day or two or, or however many times a week. But their overall time is that they're working a full-time schedule, whether it's shifting the time start you know, the time that you come in and shifting the time that you leave based upon both your personal and professional needs. I'd love to get your professional opinion, you know, when you have like, I forgot her name, the CEO, the former CEO of Yahoo, is it Meyer, Marissa Meyer? Um, Mm -hmm. Marissa Meyer. Yeah, who basically 
came in and called everyone back to the office. No one can work from home anymore or something like that. I mean, when you see that happen, how do you process that? Or if a client of yours, you know, a partner, a member came up to you and said, hey, they just did this. Why should we consider flexibility? You go back to all of the business needs for flexibility and the impact that it has. Uh, when I see things fall apart, and even if we say at firms where they'll say, oh, well, the telecommuting policy is not working, to figure out why it's not working, and most often that's a performance issue, not a telecommuting issue. In other words, they may have had somebody who there was a situation where it didn't work out for that individual. Usually that's a performance issue. That's not a policy issue. And so you should be handling things when they're not working as a performance issue, whether if it's the person wasn't producing or there was something around lack of availability. All of those are things that can be discussed with the individual, but that doesn't relate to the policy itself. The other thing is whether or not there's accurate training around the policies. And so whether or not people are actually as firms or companies that are implementing these policies, are you training and being really clear on what the success criteria is for those policies to work. What does it mean to successfully telecommute? What does that look like? And be very uh, intentional around setting that criteria. And when you describe telecommuting, I mean, I'm a business person and I know law firms think real estate. I mean, it, real estate is one of the top costs aside from personnel costs. If someone's telecommunicating, does that mean that the law firms can now find more flexible office environments where they don't need as many offices in space? And is there an economic benefit to even the idea of what you're proposing? Absolutely. And we see firms doing that. There are some firms that are looking at having a smaller footprint uh, right. because they know that they're allowing individuals to be able to work from home. So we've seen that happening. We see companies that do that where in order to come in, you know, they create, they have a smaller office. And so they expect that a certain percentage are going to be working from home. So you actually, they, they don't have formal offices for everybody. They have an open office space where people sign up for time, depending on when they're coming into the office. There's all sorts of ways. There certainly are real estate costs involved, real estate cost savings involved. But there's also lots of times where people are forced to work from home, whether I live in the D.C. area, we shut down depending on and sometimes with not a whole lot of snow that happens right. and people are forced to work from home. If you're not already set up in that way and are not able to be effective, that's lost time. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if this is an actual statistic that you would be aware of with your members, but when you're discussing and they're initiating you on flexibility, is there a percentage of the office or of their workforce that are actually successfully doing this on telecommuting? I don't know that there's a percentage per se, but we hear of a number of firms where they are successfully having telecommuting policies put in place. And where these policies fall down is often on the implementation. So what are the usage rates of around your policies? If we see a firms that have a lot of policies, which a lot of firms do, the problem is their usage rates are very low. And so we talk about how do you successfully implement a policy because you're not going to get the business benefit from these policies that we talk about unless people are actually effectively using them. And why do you think the usage rate is so low? Because I think there's a lot of stigma around it. So oftentimes we see these policies in place and they're written policies, but they're handed out with a wink and a nod that it's career suicide if you take advantage of them. Oh, and so wow. oftentimes people feel like, yeah, that's great that we have this paper policy, but effectively, if I were to do it, I'm going to be punished, marginalized. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, let's let's shift gears to um, something I know that's you know very much on your heart and, and what you're doing with your members. So, what are some top takeaways for law firms to consider when wanting to put women in leadership? More women, in essence. And I think in terms of understanding the impact of diversity and that that as an organization makes you better. Uh, that that is an important thing to understand. That as you look at your leadership, you will be a better firm if you have a more diverse group of individuals at the leadership. And that is, at the end of the day, as law firms are selling top talent, you can't just be selling talent, you know, 50% of the talent pool. You want to make sure that as you are 
looking at your talent pool, that you have a diverse talent pool, not just at the associate ranks, but at the partnership ranks as well. Do you have any examples without divulging confidentiality of firms experiencing aha of getting more women in in their ranks? Any success stories around winning business or examples where they're starting to see the light? You know, I think that what's happening when you say in winning business, I mean, I, I do think that clients play a role and are playing a role in the success of law firms, understanding that diversity and inclusion more importantly, creating an inclusive environment is incredibly important. And so I think there are examples of firms that when you say, aha, I I think this starts from leadership at the top. And I think there are lots of firm leaders that understand the importance of creating a diverse and inclusive environment within their firms and making sure that more women are getting into leadership. In terms of seeing a lot of the results, I would like to see more things happening uh, and to start to see real change in terms of in the ranks of firms where we are seeing more leadership and more more women being able to feel like they can they can reach the leadership roles within firms happening at a quicker pace. Here's another question. What advice, Manar, would you give someone who's listening who wants to start initiatives in diversity, inclusion, and flexibility at the workplace? I would say in terms of take the temperature and get a sense of where leadership falls on these issues and find the people who have power within the organization to help spearhead the initiative as that kind of visibility, you'll be able to have more success at creating that initiative. So if you can at least start with leadership or finding the people who have leadership here as to building the business case as to why this is incredibly important, what difference it makes within the organization, that is the best way to start. Because from there, you can then build momentum. Yeah, that's excellent. Kind of moving on to questions I like to ask people uh, that I'm interviewing is that might be more personal. Right now in your life, kind of personally, what are you finding yourself passionate about? I really continue to be passionate about women's empowerment uh, and making sure that we continue to see women leading within their organizations and within, frankly, personally and professionally, leading a 360 life. I spend a lot of time thinking about work-life issues and looking at work-life autonomy. And what does that mean? What does that mean to me personally? And what does that mean for others? And how does that, I guess, come out out of your, out of your life day to day outside of the Alliance? So as I mentioned, I have three boys. Uh, I spend a lot of time with my boys. I spend a lot of time looking at how do I define success personally and how do I find define success professionally, both as in terms of personally, how do I define success as a mother, as a wife, as a daughter? Who do I want to surround myself with? And then I spend a lot of time thinking as I lead an organization, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for others? What's the impact that we can have? Yeah. So with the spare time that you do have in life right now in the D.C. area, what what do you find yourself doing? So I spend a lot of time on different fields and watching sporting events, given that I have three boys. (laughs) So I (laughs) spend a lot of time watching soccer, (laughs) lots of soccer games and uh, uh, basketball and diving. Those are the three sports that my kids play. How old are your boys? 16, 13, and 10. Oh, gosh. So they're all in their teens at this point. I mean, your youngest is almost there. Three more years. Yeah. (laughs) I hold on to the (laughs) 10-year-old. Are are they getting into the kind of the traveling side of things? I mean, league teams or how how competitive are we getting? They are. So my my son, who's a diver, is on the national team. My my other son, who's a soccer player, is on his um, travel team. And my 10-year-old is on two basketball teams. So... Lots of sports. <laughs> That's excellent. And um, are you the, the rowdy mom type or are you the consistent come and watch? No, I'm the uh, mindset mom. I'm the one who sits quietly but talks to them later are you? <laughs> about <laughs> positive mindset and looking at everything from a positive, a positive focus aspect. Not the rowdy. I'm not the, no, not the rowdy mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm there to cheer them on in whatever capacity they, however they do. Were you, uh, w- w- were you into sports yourself when you were growing up? I was not. I was, I was a debater. So this oh. was a completely different, <laughs> a, a different aspect. And thus you're a lawyer. My husband was a big sports person. Though. Oh, was he? Okay, fun. Does, does he have the availability to come to the games too? 
he does. We very much partner on everything. So absolutely. That's fun. That's fun. And so knowing that you're a lawyer and I have a bias of lawyers that most of them like to read or kind of been ingrained to learn how to read. Do you, Mm -hmm. um, do, do you have any recommended books right now you're reading or authors you recommend for our listenership? So I just finished reading Essentialism. I think that's a great book okay. and uh, one that I think very much applies to leading a 360 life and what we're doing on a day-to-day basis and how to make sure we do what is essential and how we define what is essential for us. So I would recommend that book. Yeah, that's excellent. It's great in both a business book and, a pers- and lots of ways to apply it to your personal life as well. Your leading organization, it stems from the area of law that you practice dealing with workplace environments as it relates to diversity and inclusion. And I just have to ha- you know, ask myself, what's influenced you or who has influenced you to come to this place to trumpet you know, uh, and bring a voice to something that there's just many people who don't have one in their work environments? What's your story? Who, you know, Who's inspired you to do this? I think, I mean, I was very much inspired both from the life that my parents had and have, and then also from my own personal experience of when I had my first child and I wanted to continue to litigate, but I didn't want to do it on a full-time basis and started to look at what was happening to women. And as I kind of created my path, one that wasn't very clear at the beginning, I saw a lot of, or I had a lot of people ask me, well, if I could have done it the way you did it, I would have stayed and so started really to look at how can we create change in which people don't feel like they have to leave if that's what they want to do. Oh, so, so you that's kind of, what they want to do. So, so you sort of pioneered a little bit of flexibility as it related to leave with your son? In terms of, yeah, absolutely. In terms of setting my own path. Yeah, that's excellent. Do you care to share or elaborate a little bit about your parents' story? So my parents are immigrants from Egypt and my, you know, just sort of seeing their path and what they did and how they both inspired us as I'm one of three as well. Uh, And I look at the life that my mom had. She's no longer living. uh, The role that she had and what she played in terms of coming to this country and my father as well, who, who is living and continues to inspire me every day to just always reach for what it is that we want and not kind of look at the obstacles, but continue to have a, we we grew up with an understanding of you can achieve anything that it is you want. You just have to decide and then chart your path. That has always been something that has influenced me. And rightfully so. The immigrant story is, it's got to be the most inspiring story in our country. I mean, it's just, uh, I love hearing it. And we're all immigrants at this point. Um, (laughs) Well, you know, last question, wanted to have you elaborate and what the question is, what advice would you give yourself as going back and starting over again as an employment litigator in your career? If you were to go back, what advice would you give yourself if you're going to do that over again? I, I think continue to be open to experiences and a bit of surrender to that everything will, everything works out. <laughs> And so really looking at being open to as many experiences as you can have and different, making sure that you continue, that I would have continued to build a network. Um, I think those are all things that are important. Yeah. Good advice. Manar, it's been a, an honor, a pleasure. Thank you for your time today. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone, who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. A PDF transcript of this episode is available on our website. Go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes. If you have questions or would like to recommend someone to be on the podcast, please email them to podcast at findthelions.com. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.